Great. So this is joint with Severn Bornstein, my UC Berkeley colleague. Since 2006, U.S. households have received more than $18 billion in federal tax credits for weatherizing their homes, installing, sol installing solar panels, buying hybrids and electric vehicles, and other what we're calling clean energy investments. So in this paper, we want to ask who claims these credits? How do receipts vary across income groups, and does this distributional pattern provide any broader insights about program design? We've been surprised in how much we've ended up talking about efficiency while we're writing a paper about distributional impacts. So we got interested in this um, because there's growing enthusiasm among U.S. policymakers for policies that subsidize green products. So KP KPMG does this ranking of major economies based on their greenness. This is based on how much their government, how much government action there is towards climate change or other green objectives. So the U.S. is first overall, but what's really interesting is that they do a breakout of tax incentives versus tax penalties. So tax penalties is like carbon tax, gasoline tax. On this, the U.S. is far down the list at number 14. The reason the, the KPMG puts the U.S. overall is that there's just this plethora of tax incentives for green goods. Now, the two may seem very similar, but they're really not. And economists for a long time have pointed out that subsidizing green is less efficient than taxing brown. There's a couple of things, I mean, but perhaps the most important is that subsidies, technology subsidies, never going to get usage right. You can get somebody to buy a Prius or to install an energy efficient window, but you can't get them to drive less or run their air conditioner less. Subsidies are also a very coarse instrument, forces us to pick winners. And for example, there's a recent NBR paper by um, uh, Stephen Holland and co-authors looking at electric cars and finds that there's just enormous heterogeneity and externality impact of electric cars from big external benefits in states like California where, where electricity comes from natural gas and renewables to big external costs in states like North Dakota where electricity comes from coal. With a uniform technology subsidy, you're never going to get that right. Another problem that a number of recent studies have, have, have been pointing to and emphasizing that many subsidy recipients are in for marginal, getting paid to do what they otherwise would have done. Distributional effects of clean energy subsidies have received much less attention. And there seems to be, at least among some, a presumption that subsidies are, are equitable or somehow more equitable than first best policies. Here's a recent quote by Billy Pizer. Many alternatives to Pigouvian taxes involve smaller or negligible redistributions. If distributional concerns matter and cannot be adequately addressed, the welfare advantage of Pigouvian policies is far from obvious. So we really, we looked out in the literature and actually found very little on this, but it wasn't obvious to us. So certainly what's true is that Whenever anyone introduces the possibility of a gas or carbon tax, there's, there's always an outcry about possible concerns about regressivity and distributional impacts. But it just wasn't obvious to us at all that, uh, that subsidizing green goods was going to have better distributional impacts. So what we do is we review clean energy income tax credits available since 2006. So we're first going to do just some pure description, talk about what's covered, eligibility requirements, important changes. We're going to look for evidence of impacts using shipment and sales data, but that's going to be basically before and after comparison, so we're not going to draw strong causal conclusions from that. Then we're going to turn to the heart of it, which is to look at tax return data to see who claimed these credits, compare the distributed impa impacts to tax credits and the carbon tax, and then perform an ancillary analysis aimed at understanding non-refundability, which ends up being very important. So most of the, most of the existing literature on, on clean energy subsidies has correctly looked at efficiency questions and cost-effectiveness questions. There's much less done on distributional impacts. Most of the work on distribu distributional impacts has looked at, say, the gasoline tax, carbon tax, and other first best approaches. Very little has been done on clean energy subsidies. There's a paper by Jeff Dubin and, and Steve Henson that looks at an earlier round of clean energy subsidies. And then there's two very nice papers by Molly Sherlock from the Congressional Research Service, which look at two of the, f of the four tax credits we're, we're going to look at for s and some of the years that we're going to look at. We see our work is really building on that work. Uh, so we're going to look at four different tax credits. The first and biggest is something called the non-business energy property credit. So we took line item IRS data to just try to get a handle of, well, what, 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 where, is this, where are these tax expenditures going? Turns out the biggest category is energy efficient windows. So that's $4 billion over the period 2005 to 2012. And then there's just an entire, you know, a laundry list, qualified furnaces, boilers, ACs, water heaters, et cetera, et cetera. The spending across years is actually pretty interesting. So we had a policy like this. This, this was like an example Bob Inman said, you know, we needed policies that were on the shelf to roll out. Roll out. This is very much like that. Uh, during the 90s and the 2000s, there, there was no tax credit like this. In 2006, the, the credit's introduced at a 10% rate. It, it's there for 2006, 2007. 2008, the credit goes away entirely. 
but then comes back under ARA with a vengeance. It's increased to a 30% tax rate, and the limit goes from 500 to 1500. So you see this huge surge in expenditures in 2009 and 2010 only with over $5 billion in tax expenditures in those years, then goes back to 10% in 2011 and 2012. So if you thought that, the, that the, this tax credit was really being effective in inducing changes in behavior, you'd expect to see not a lot of take up of energy efficient durable goods in 2008, and then a surge in 2009 and 2010. So we pulled DOE data on, on sales of energy efficient natural gas furnaces, central air conditioners, heat pumps, and a couple other minor categories. 2009, 2010 seemed like okay years for shipments, but it's well within the, ra well within the range of shipments we observe in, in other years. So we don't draw super strong conclusions, but it certainly doesn't just jump off the page that there's this, that we're getting a huge impact uh, during those ARA years. We looked at some minor categories too, natural gas boilers and oil furnaces, the same. Second credit we're going to look at is the, is the poorly, poorly named residential energy efficiency property credit. The other credit really is much more about energy efficiency. This is about household renewables. The, the number one category here with $1.8 billion in tax expenditures over this period is solar PV systems. So spending follows kind of a similar pattern. Starts in the credit, this credit starts in 2006. Generosity's increased in 2009, but then th it's not fallen off like the other one. It's, it's remained a 30% credit actually with no cap uh, from 2009. It's going to go through, through the end of 2016 if it's not renewed. So this is a 30% tax credit. Just to be clear, if you put a $30,000 solar panel on your roof, that's a $10,000 credit. So this, is a very, this credit has this is a very generous credit per per credit recipient. What's true is that this credit has been in place during an, during an enormous period of growth in the, UC, in the solar panel, uh, residential solar panel market. Experts point to cheap solar panels probably being a bigger, bigger driver than, than tax credits, but there's no question that the tax credit has played, has played a role here. We're now, th the third credit we're going to look at is the alternative motor vehicle credit, which, go which goes to hybrids, natural gas, and other alternative uh, fuel vehicles. You wouldn't know it from driving around Berkeley, California, but this is actually a pretty small credit. Uh, every, in Berkeley, ha every other car is a hybrid, but this credit na nationally ended up added up to less the, a half a billion dollars over the period we're looking. So Toyota is the real dominant dominant um, manufacturer here, so we broke them out from other manufacturers. This shows hybrid vehicle sales, and if you if if you were if you if you were involved in this at all, you you'd know that. This, this credit had this very unusual feature, which, which was that it phased out for an individual manufacturer once that manufacturer had sold 60,000 vehicles. So Toyota, the credit for Toyota phased out in 2007. For most other manufacturers, didn't phase out till the end of 2010. You see a, um, you, you see a spike in Toyota sales in 2007, um, interestingly, but you really don't see a fall off in hybrid vehicle sales in 2011 when the, when, the credit, when the credit ends for hybrids. If anything, 2011, 2012, 2013 have been pretty good years for hybrid vehicle sales. But again, this is basically before and after comparison, so we're not, we're not, making, we're not trying to make very strong causal statements here. Uh, last, we're going to look at the electric vehicle credit, which comes in later and uh, uh, has and as a similar pattern, kind of like the solar PV in that the entire growth in US, U.S. electric and plug-in hybrid vehicle sales has occurred during, under the period of this credit. So the credit comes in in 2010, <laughs> and, yeah, and we see a large growth in Nissan Leaf sales, Chevy Bolt sales, Tesla Model S sales. Um, so very hard in that context to make any causal statements. The, better, the more credible evidence that, uh, uh, that looks at the impact of credits like this has looked at state-level variation in sales in, in credit amount and found uh, economic and statistically significant effects. Okay, so I want to now turn to the distributional impacts, and we're going to use IRS, a variety of different IRS uh, data sets for this. The nice thing about IRS data is we're going to have this enormous representative sample, uh, very accurate measures of credit, very accurate measures of income. There are some inherent limitations that we're, that we're going to emphasize. First is we're going to obviously exclude households that don't file tax returns. So we compared census to IRS data, and we think there's 26 million Americans who were not represented by any tax form in 2012. Those Americans couldn't collect any of these credits, and they tend to be very low income. So we actually think this exclusion in anything is going to lead us to understate the degree to which these credits are received by high-income households. Uh, we're also going to be forced to use annual income. We don't have, we don't have any measure of, of lifetime income, but it would be very interesting in, in future work to, to, to get a better measure of kind of lifetime well-being of these households. 
We're also not going to be able to get it all at the question of subsidy incidence. So the statutory incidence of these credits is clearly on, on the households receiving the credits, but, but we're, we're not going to be able to speak to the degree to which, this, to which prices of clean energy goods respond, responded to the subsidies. There's one actually really nice study on this by my new Berkeley colleague, Jim Salee, that shows near zero pass-through with the alternative motor vehicle credit. So here's the main results. What we're going to do is divide households into uh, AGI categories. These first five categories are essentially quintiles. And then the last category, 200K plus, is about 3% of filers. This is across all years from 2006 to 2012. And this is for residential ener energy credits, which combines the first two ta tax credit categories I talked about. So what we find is that, about that, that there's low take up of the credit in the first three quintiles. So the average credit per return, and this is average across all returns, those that take the credit or don't take the credit, is under $10. It, it approximately doubles in the fourth quintile, approximately doubles again in the fifth quintile, and then approximately doubles again when you get to uh, households who earn over 200000 a year. For the alternative motor vehicle credit, the, pa the distributional pattern is very similar. About 10 percent of the credit going to the bottom three quintiles, about 60 percent going to the top quintile. And then the electric vehicle credit we find is much, high, much more highly concentrated among, high income, among the high income categories. Ni essentially no take up in the bottom four quintiles. Ninety percent of the credit is captured uh, or uh, received by the top income quintile, and about forty percent of the total credit goes to households who, who have an AGI over, over two hundred thousand a year. Uh, we look in the paper to see whether this what, what's uh, to see whether this is coming from the extensive or intensive margin, and it's and it's both. It's both. So higher income households are more likely to claim and claim higher uh, hi higher amounts when they do claim. Now, income's highly concentrated, too, so we wanted, to, we wanted to have a sense of how the concentration of these credits compares to the concentration of income. For this, we constructed concentration curves. So rank all the filers uh, by AGI, and then ask the question, what, what's the cumulative fraction of either credits or income that's received by that group? Here's what you get. And so the interpretation is very simple here. For example, take, the, take, the, take point 0.5, go halfway down. If you look at the bottom 50% of taxpayers receive about 15% of AGI, less than 10% of these tax credits. It, f it swaps at about 75, at about 0.75, and then for very high income levels, we're finding the credits are actually less concentrated than income. For the alternative motor vehicle credit, the pattern is almost identical. Again, crossing at about 0.75, more concentrated than income at low income levels and less concentrated than income at high income levels. And then for the electric vehicle credit, then, is much more concentrated than, than income with a curve that's obviously much, much below the orange income curve. So you'd say, wait a second, what, you know, these are tax expenditures. Aren't all tax expenditures, don't all tax expenditures go to high-income high high uh, filers? Well, uh, CBO is very helpful here. They just did, they just analyzed the 2013 largest, the top 10 tax expenditures for 2013, and here's the distributional impact. So they find about 30% going to the bottom three quintiles and about 50% going to the top quintile. So what we're finding in these clean energy tax credits are actually considerably higher, more concentrated in income than, these, than, this, than, than the top 10 major tax expenditures. We think this is pretty surprising because if you think about what these major tax expenditures are, most of them are exclusions like, uh, like employer paid uh, health insurance or deductions like the mortgage tax deduction in which case there's a mechanical relationship uh, with income driven by increasing marginal tax rates. These are all credits. These are dollar for dollar regardless of what your marginal tax rate is. So, uh, so, so we're surprised with how uh, highly concentrated these tax credits are. Indeed, if you compare them to other tax credits, they're much, much more concentrated. So here's, here's concentration coefficients for the different tax credits, and then the five biggest uh, tax credits in the U.S. in 2012. These are concentration coefficients. So this is the area, this is the area underneath those concentration curves uh, divided by the entire area under the 45 degree line. And so what you see is that the earned income tax credit, for example, is highly redistributive by design. It actually has a concentration curve that's above the 45 degree line. So that's, that, that makes sense. But the making work pay credit, child tax credit, first time home buyer credit, these, all these credits are much more evenly distributed across, across filers. The one that's not, is the foreign tax credit. And actually, the electric vehicle credit is not as concentrated, but it's approaching the degree of concentration we see in the foreign tax credit. So one, of the, one, of the, one thing that, to note 
um, is that the, f the first four major tax credits listed there are all refundable. And these clean energy tax credits that we're looking at are all not refundable. And to tell you the truth, when we, in we went into this, this was not even on our radar screen. This was not something that I didn't think was going to be a big mover. Over a third of filers in 2012 had non-positive tax liability and thus are, uh, thus are ineligible for these refundable credits. So we've, we, we've, eventually, we've now convinced ourselves that this actually is, does play an important role in the concentration of income that we're seeing. Um, it's reasonable to ask, does this matter? Would these, would these filers with non-positive non, non tax liability be claiming the credits if they, if they were eligible? To try to get at this, and this is not a perfect test, but w what we did is we'll, let's just, what if we just look at take up of these ener of clean energy tax credits against uh, tax liability and project this down to zero? And, and if the intercept is positive, that suggests that these guys with non-zero, with non-positive tax liability would indeed take the credit. And it does look like they, they would at lower amounts than higher income, higher income categories, but they would. Um, and thinking about it more deeply, the whole idea of a non-refundable credit is odd. Um, we, we looked, uh, this was new to us, we looked around, didn't find a lot of literature on this. Uh, th in fact, the only thing we found on this was a really nice paper by Peter Orsake and, and um, uh, co-authors called Efficiency and Tax Incentives, the Case for Refundable Tax Credits. It says, I, I really like this quote, um, it's extremely unlikely that externalities and elasticities change in an abrupt and discontinuous fashion exactly at the point of zero income tax liability. So what are, why are we doing this? We're, we're, we're motivated by externalities. We've got two households. Both of them, if they install an energy efficient window, they're going to redu reduce externalities, but yet we're treating them very differently based on one has zero tax liability and one has $1,000 of tax liability. It seems odd to us. We haven't been able to come up with an economic argument for making these credits non-refundable. Putting it all together, how do these tax credits compare to a carbon tax? So here's some, here's some uh, quint biquintile evidence from a, um, a new paper by Rob Williams and co-authors in the National Tax Journal. A carbon tax would be disproportionately paid by high income quintiles. Tax credits are disproportionately received by high income quintiles. For a carbon tax has much better distribu distributional impacts. You, this is really dramatic in the case of uh, lump sum rebates. So the, in the far right here, if we, did, if, we, if we rebated a carbon tax with lump sum rebates, you could actually make the bottom three quintiles strictly better off on average, even before accounting for environment, environmental externalities. Uh, and you know, just more generally, I think this makes sense. The, the top quintile in some of Metcalf's, Metcalf's work finds that the top end quintile spends about uh, four times as much, would spend about four times as much as the, as the first quintile. Makes sense. There's, a, uh, there's carbon embodied in everything that we, that we consume. High income, I income households consume more, so they would pay more. Uh, I want to wrap up. I know I'm staying between now and lunch, so, uh, and I do, I do welcome feedback here. But we're finding that these credits are going predominantly to higher income Americans. The bottom three quintiles receive 10% while the top receive 60%. The most extreme is this electric vehicle credit, which is real, which is really uh, car targeted the Tesla, the Tesla community, driven by both participation rates and size of credit claimed by recipients. And it's you know, considerably more regressive than other tax credits and, and a carbon tax. We're also struck by the horizontal inequity here. So 40 plus million U.S. households are ineligible because they don't have any tax liability. Our results suggest that these households would claim the credits if they were eligible. And I haven't even mentioned, but renters and landlords are ineligible for both the, win the energy efficiency window type thing and for the solar PV type credit. That also seems odd to us. We can't come up with an economic argument for excluding renters and landlords. Uh, and that, that is a sig significant share of the market. So I guess, I understand that, there, that, that it's politically easier to put through a subsidy. It's easier to put through a subsidy than a tax. But I think, this I think it's becoming increasingly clear that this choice has real, comes at real cost, both in terms of efficiency and equity. Thank you.